The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own and The Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. <laughs> From the promise of legalization. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Rough Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Yeah, I hear you you had a question for me. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. Ah, good day, Tokers and Tokets. Welcome to the show. It is Thursday, May 2nd, 2013, and it's got to be 420, somewhere in the world. Thanks for joining us here. Still getting over a little bit of that cold, so have uh, some voice issues, but I uh, hope you can bear with me for just another couple of days. Speaking of just another couple of days, we are just two days away from the Global Cannabis March, May 4th, Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. We will be marching from Pioneer Courthouse Square. We've got a booth there. We're going to be there with Herb Thrasher, who's emceeing the event. Uh, we got Ico from uh, Oregon Normal is going to be there. Anthony with uh, National Cannabis Coalition will be there. Just about every uh, Oregon group group will be there at pioneer courthouse square we got the square for the whole day we got booths we got information we got speeches plus of course the march which takes off at high noon and don't be late people i missed my first march nine years ago because i was five minutes late they took off we do this on time high noon pioneer courthouse square get there early we got plenty of signs if you don't have one we got one that you can carry we got bullhorns we have a good time and we advocate we take to the streets advocating for marijuana legalization not just for portland not just for oregon but for the entire world so please join us if you're not in the portland area go google global cannabis march and find out where the march is nearest you there's over 200 cities that are involved in this most major cities in north america are involved my god toronto gets 30,000 people if you're in the toronto area make sure you hit that march all sorts of fun to be had. Check it out on Google, Global Cannabis March. Now, on today's show, we have got our Cops Say Legalized Drugs segment. Larry Talley is joining us. He is a former U.S. Navy intelligence specialist. So we'll talk a little bit about foreign policy and prohibition and uh, anything he has to say about what's going on down in Texas, because he's calling us from Flower Mound, Texas today. Also on the show, we're going to take a look at a bill in Colorado that seeks to come up with special definitions for marijuana with respect to child in endangerment and the good news coming out of our headlines today of course is that maryland has become the 19th medical marijuana state that's right we got 19 people and it's just going to keep rolling and rolling and rolling so uh be ready for that coming up in our news. That's coming up next. Also on today's show, Bago Swago will be calling in for our daily toker tunes. It's Groovin' Thursday, so he's got some cool hip-hop for us from Lucifer Jackson, I think the guy's name is. Did I get that right? Let's check that out. Yeah, uh, Lucifer Jenkins. Excuse me, Lucifer Jenkins. Can't wait to hear this. All that and more coming up on the Russ Bell Show, plus your calls in hour two. Stick around. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strain. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. 
check out our genetic diversity at tgagenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. This is your 420 Radio News for Thursday, May 2nd, 2013. I'm Russ Belleville. Governor O'Malley signs death penalty repeal, medical marijuana bill, and other measures from the Washington Post. Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley signed a law to legalize medical marijuana well into a ceremony that stretched about two hours. The legislation legalizing medical marijuana limits distribution to academic medical centers, which will be required to monitor patients and publish their findings. Legislative analysts say it's unlikely that dispensing of the drug would begin before 2016. It is also unclear how many institutions might choose to participate. Two of the state's most prominent, the University of Maryland Medical System and Johns Hopkins University, have been reluctant to get involved. But supporters of the measure have hailed it as a significant step toward a compassionate treatment option for people with such illnesses as cancer and multiple sclerosis. 18 states and the District of Columbia have enacted similar laws. New Hampshire Senate rejects marijuana decriminalization bill from Boston.com. New Hampshire won't join neighboring Maine and Massachusetts in decriminalizing possession of small amounts of marijuana after the Senate rejected what it called a deeply flawed proposal, removing criminal penalties for possession of up to a quarter ounce of the drug. Senator Donna Soucy, a Manchester Democrat, said Thursday the bill makes restrictions on marijuana possession more lenient than alcohol or tobacco. There are no age parameters in the House pressed bill, House passed bill, excuse me, so technically children could use the drug. She also said the penalties don't ramp up for minors who are repeat offenders. A bill prohibiting the classification of hemp as a controlled substance to be grown for the industrial use of its fibers and seed oil was retained to be studied further. Ohio lawmaker introduces marijuana legalization proposals from 10TV.com. Ohio State Democratic Representative Robert Hagan of Youngstown introduced two proposals at the State House on Thursday that would make marijuana legal in the state. The first bill focuses on medical usage, while the second measure would provide for a statewide vote for marijuana legalization. Hagan said House Bill 153 would allow patients with certain chronic conditions to use cannabis to treat their, their ailments. If passed, Ohio would be the 20th state to pass medical marijuana laws. The second measure, House Joint Resolution 6, would provide Ohioans the chance for a statewide vote to legalize and tax marijuana. A news release from Hagan's office said the measure is based on recently passed legislation in Colorado. Seven San Francisco marijuana dispensaries targeted by the DEA from Smell the Truth. We received word Wednesday that seven medical marijuana dispensaries permitted by the city of San Francisco are being investigated by the Drug Enforcement Administration. The DEA is trying to force the closure of at least one of the targeted dispensaries, the Hemp Center. The Hemp Center's landlord is being threatened with 40 years prison, property forfeiture, and asset seizure for renting office space to the Hemp Center, sources say. At least four landlords in San Jose received similar letters Friday. The latest polls show almost two out of three Americans agree that federal authorities should leave state legal marijuana alone. Almost three out of four Americans agree the estimated $7.6 billion federal war on pot each year costs more than it is worth. The new threats this week follow, a f follow federal threats against all dispensaries open in Santa Ana, California last week, as well as the raid of a San Diego dispensary who had an operating agreement with the city of San Diego. The DEA also threatened 11 medical marijuana clubs in Seattle. Marijuana magazines scrutinized in Colorado may be treated like porn. From the HuffingtonPost.com Marijuana magazines are under scrutiny in Colorado where lawmakers might require stores to put them behind the counter. The unusual provision to treat pot, pot magazines like pornography was considered Thursday in a Senate committee. If approved, the provision would make Colorado the first state to require stores that allow entry to shoppers under age 21 to place pot magazines behind the counter. A lawyer for High Times Magazine called the magazine restriction, quote, patently unconstitutional, end quote, and said there's no legal precedent for treating pictures of a drug as obscene. Lawyer David Holland said the magazine would likely sue if the provision becomes law, saying, quote, it is a content-based restriction that violates freedom of speech, end quote. 
The magazine provision was among a long list of pot regulations awaiting a vote in a Senate committee Thursday. The bill also includes labeling and packaging requirements and a limit on marijuana purchases by out-of-state visitors. The bill limits retail sales to out-of-state customers to one-fourth of an ounce in a single transaction, though all adults would be allowed to possess a full ounce of the drug. This has been your 420 Radio News for Thursday, May 2nd, 2013. I'm Russ Belville. When we come back, we go behind the headlines and take a look at another proposal in Colorado. This one would set specific definitions of child endangerment with respect to marijuana cultivation and consumption. You're listening to The Russ Belville Show on 420radio.org. We'll be right back. Adam Hand of Handmade Apparel produces quality custom designs for t-shirts, hats, and other apparel. Handmade Apparel is the official design shop for 420 Radio, The Russ Belville Show, Ganja John, and Cascadia Concentrates, among many clients who rely on Adam Hand for everything from short-run custom projects to full-run clothing lines. Adam's meticulous designs are individually crafted and screened in vibrant high-definition color. Visit handmadeapparel.biz to browse the selection of handmade gear or to get a personal quote for your own designs. Handmade Apparel, a proud supporter of 420radio.org. Where is he? Don't worry, he's gonna be here. Where is he? What time is it? Uh, 420. 420. 420! 420. 420. Yeah. Time to get Ah, <laughs> 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 oh, God. My bones hurt from not smoking. 420 is when we smoke. God, I love 420. It's my favorite three digit number. Do you guys think anyone else knows about 420? What do you mean? It's our thing. You know, we are always saying it, you know. Yeah. That's because we are always smoking at 420, you know. Do you, do you think anyone else has caught on by now? Why would anyone give a rat's dick about when we light up? Uh, actually, I may have told uh, somebody. What? How could you? That's our thing, dude. Our thing. Not somebody else's thing. Who did you tell? And he's just my older brother. That's not that bad. That's, That's not that bad. bad. He's in the Grateful Dead. You told the Grateful Dead about 420? Who? Uh-huh. The greatest rock band of our generation. You told them about our secret smoking ritual? It's, it's not that bad. Okay? The Grateful Dead? Like, I've never heard of them, so it's, it's not like the whole world knows. You know? It's not going to turn into a big holiday. Um, actually... you got to be shitting, shitting me. me! What the hell is wrong with you? Listen, relax, okay? It's not that bad. In fact, imagine your name in lights. The Waldos. 420. The holiday. You know what? I can't wait till we are famous, people. Hey, where does 420 even come from? It's Hitler's birthday. Sir, do you think there will or should come a time for us to discuss the possibility of legalization, regulation, and control of all drugs, thereby doing away with the violent criminal market as well as a major source of funding for international terrorism? Thank you so much for your time, Mr. President. Well, I think this is an uh, entirely legitimate topic uh, for debate. Name the time and place, Mr. President. Radical Russ has been prepping for this debate full-time since 2005. The Russ Belleville Show. 
All right, time for us to go behind the headlines. And today we get a story from Jacob Sullum out at Reason.com. And uh, this one is a pretty harrowing tale here. Uh, Colorado legislators drop plans to cancel marijuana legalization as tax and regulation bills advance. So this is uh, this is one of the stories we're going to have kind of a good news, bad news segment. The good news in this, uh, reading from Reason here, talk of making marijuana legalization in Colorado contingent on voter approval of cannabis-specific taxes has died down in the state legislature, which has less than a week left in its current session. Uh, what they were trying to do here is they're trying to get a certain tax structure passed and some folks in the legislature there were trying to tie it to keeping uh, to, to a repeal that basically like if you don't pass this tax plan then we're going to repeal amendment 64 <laughs> and that's what they were trying to do there uh to strong arm this particular tax proposal through looks like that's not going to happen and uh plus it would be difficult to happen even if they tried it would require a two-thirds vote of the legislature because it's a constitutional amendment thing, right? And then uh, the repeal measure couldn't be on the ballot this year because in odd-numbered years in Colorado, that's when they do uh, the tax measures, right? So they'd have to wait till 2014 to even try this thing. So it, does, it looks like it's dead in the water, not going to happen. So that's some great news coming out of Colorado. But this other bill that gets discussed here at the end of the story, uh, especially considering what we've been going through this past week here on the show, uh, definitely caught my attention. Uh, Jacob Sullum writes, a bill the Senate is considering, SB 278, would allow a finding of abuse or neglect when a child's health or welfare is endangered by an adult's marijuana cultivation or consumption. The bill includes an assurance that it does not authorize an investigation based solely on marijuana growing possession or use that is legal under Amendment 64. Nor does it explicitly equate production or consumption of marijuana in the presence of a minor with child endangerment. Although it says, quote, the unrestricted access to the controlled substance by a child may establish endangerment, end quote, which, quote, may also be established by other circumstances when a child's health or welfare is threatened by the drug activity, end quote. Now, this gives me some pause here because it's one of those situations where why are you writing it into the law when we already have laws against child endangerment? We already have laws against child endangerment if the kid has come in possession of a drug, whether it's legal or illegal, whether the kid is sneaking Oxycontins out of the medicine cabinet or whether the kid is sneaking buds out of the, the baggie, regardless we already have laws to be able to deal with that. And it troubles me that we would come up with a specific definition and this specific sort of regulation having to do with cultivation and consumption of marijuana when we don't seem to need that same sort of specific language with respect to the home brewing and consumption of beer. Certainly, if someone is home brewing beer and they're giving growlers of it to their 15 year old to party with I'm pretty sure we could come up with a child endangerment case there and we wouldn't have to have a specific statute to address that so I can only think that the purpose of trying to put this law together this SB 278 is to provide some sort of footing some sort of backing to a child child endangerment charge if a kid is caught with a bud at school or if the grow isn't as enclosed and locked as the uh, cop searching the place would like it to be. Given that we have so many people in law enforcement that do not like the fact that Amendment 64 has passed, and given the fact that we have seen in our own experiences on this show how the authorities will use the threat or the action of taking away people's children as a way to get them to comply when they can't do so otherwise through the law, this gives me concern. SB 278 in Colorado would allow a finding of abuse or neglect when a child's health or welfare is endangered by an adult's marijuana cultivation or consumption. So what will be endangering to the child? Maybe you smoke too often or smoke too much. Is that endangering to the child? You left your pipe on the coffee table where the kid can walk around. Is that endangerment? Is that enough to take your kid away when you could leave your beer on the coffee table and I doubt they'd take your kid away? 
All we want as marijuana consumers is to be treated with the same respect and to be afforded the same rights, privileges, and responsibilities as beer drinkers. If you don't have a specific law about child endangerment with, res with respect to the home brewing and drinking of beer, why should there be one for marijuana? I wish it, people could just understand it as simply as that. They think us smoking pot is somehow different than people drinking wine or sharing a beer at a picnic. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would sell you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. Marijuana and alcohol are the two most popular recreational drugs in America. Marijuana smoking is non-toxic, relatively safe, and has a low risk of dependence. Alcohol drinking is potentially fatal, dangerous to society, and is quite addictive. Marijuana is safer, so why are we driving people to drink? That's the question of the new book, Marijuana is Safer, So Why Are We Driving People to Drink? by Paul Armentano, Mason Tvert, and Steve Fox. Visit Amazon.com or ChelseaGreen.com today to order your copy of Marijuana is Safer or visit MarijuanaIsSafer.com. What's happening, cool cats? This is Big Daddy, and I want you to cruise on over to the Funky Roller Rink. We'll be grooving all night long. Doors open at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, every Thursday night, right here on RadicalRust.com. Funky. Delicious. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together, so let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Groovin' Thursday, featuring rap, hip-hop, soul, and funk music. You can get downloads and more information about all our Daily Toker Tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, sit back and enjoy your Daily Toker Tunes. Welcome back, everybody. Time for some Groovin' Thursday, and we turn things over to Bago Schwago, who's on the line. How you doing? I'm doing good, sir. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing all right. I'm still breathing oxygen, and that's uh, pretty much all that counts on some days. Uh, so, hey, before Every day get, you wake up is always a plus. I like that's that. right. I check the obituaries. If I'm not there, then we might as well get on with the day. Exactly. Um, before we get on with our song, I want to remind folks that we got uh, Big Daddy Fink's Funky Roller Rink, new episode coming up tonight, uh, 8 o'clock Pacific time, and uh, the title of it says Psycho Billy. So I, I think we're going to get something very interesting tonight. Check that out at 8 o'clock. And then coming up tonight, uh, uh, 5 o'clock, right after this show, we've got last night's edition of Red Eyes Reggae Flashback with Brian the Red. Check it out. And actually, he, he plays uh, Legalize It by Peter Tosh. He actually went 28 shows. Before he played Legalize It by Peter Tosh. I was pretty surprised. All right. Got that out of the way. Let's turn things over to Bago Schwagger. What do we got for today's tune? Okay. Well, I've been doing a lot of music searching yesterday, and I'm happy to say I found quite a few tracks to keep things good for the next couple of weeks. So that's exciting. Yeah. Um, and actually, next week, I might have a guy joining us uh, to introduce his own song. So that that's really exciting as well. Uh, this guy, his name's Lucifer Jenkins. I love the name. Kind of creepy if you <laughs> yeah. know what that's all about. <laughs> Um, I couldn't find much in the guy. He's based out of Delaware. Uh, this song is actually part of the Sweet 302 mixtape. It was released back in November of 2012. Uh, they say the whole mixtape is kind of a, where rap meets R&B. And I figure we've kind of been bummed about the whole Idaho thing and what's going on up there. So this song's kind of got a good upbeat with it and thought I'd get our heads bobbing. And it's, uh, it's called Light It Up. All right. Lucifer Jenkins. Light It Up. Thanks, Bago. Should I go talk to you next week? Yeah. It's another sweet 302 classic. You know how we do. Much respect to Cypher, man. I don't know about these seeds and them sticks in your weed, man. I don't know if I can hit that. Let's go. Benita 
Apple Bum said you got it going on The party ain't done till the ganja's all gone Light it up, baby, just like them city lights Some herbal ecstasies take you to them new I flung guts in the bag, hot box and tag We smoke the best weed, no need to brag That weed you hit, you only get one breath From going suicide, or maybe sudden death Little white hairs keep me in the air I don't know about them papers, got a whole lot of stress So games is all we invest in Gotta be the green leaf, never on the seaweed We smoke loud, you smoke the pie The shit got seeds, the old nigga don't Try it. And I watch what they put in my blood You should try it like a die Motivated to be the highest Up in the bend, slide off in the road, politic with my nigga, party with the hoes, cone feet on the whip, light on my toes, quarter set the show, that's all a nigga knows, no table rolls, we keeping it G, money so proper, you should be paying a fee, but you know. I'ma share with my niggas, so pass me the lighter Let's start the cypher, got a little beer Models of the year, fresh new kicks, new things there Wear the iron long, I'm professional for real Lever on the seats, so ready to chill You know a nigga hungry, so go and get the munchies The homie don't hate, just pack the jack thing of sauce for my sake And you leaving the tip, yeah, so you smoking free and shit This is Willie Nelson, and I need your help. Alcohol prohibition didn't work in the 20s, and marijuana prohibition isn't working today. It's time we stop arresting law-abiding citizens because they prefer marijuana over alcohol. Nearly 2,000 Americans are arrested every day on marijuana charges. We're unfairly destroying the lives and careers of hundreds of thousands of people each year simply because they smoke marijuana. These are not criminals, they're average citizens like you, good neighbors who work hard, raise families, pay taxes, and contribute to their communities. We need your help to end marijuana prohibition once and for all. It's the fair thing to do. For more information, contact Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Call toll-free 888-67-NORML or visit their website at norml.org. One of the most disturbing elements of the Prohibition War is how it's made police the enemy of otherwise law-abiding cannabis consumers. Fortunately, one group of police officers knows the futility of Prohibition and reaches out to educate the community and current law enforcement. Today, the Russ Belleville Show visits with another speaker from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition with one clear message. Cops say legalize drugs. Welcome back, everybody. 29 after the hour, and I'm excited to have our next guest on. He's been a guest on the show before, and one of my favorite activists in the Lone Star State. Larry Talley is with us from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Larry, welcome back. Hey, Russ, it's good to be back. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so glad to hear from you, and, uh, you know, you're calling us down. Are you still down in Flower Mound, Texas? Is that right? 
Yes, sir. Yeah, right smack dab in the middle of the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. Okay, and that brings me to last night. I was watching the Twitter feeds coming from Texas Normal and from DFW Normal regarding testimony for a medical marijuana act, I believe it was. And I guess it ran into like midnight or later, your your guys' time. And the report I got was that there was nobody testifying in opposition to this. Do you have any uh, updates or anything on this for us? Yeah, there was. I believe there were 38 people that were that were uh, professionally uh, uh, providing testimony to the, to the Texas legislature, specifically the committee that has that bill in uh, in their laps. And and you're right, there was nobody that spoke in opposition. These were uh, just regular Texans, people just like you and me, people that are that, that are listening to your show, just average people that were giving really good testimony to the Texas legislature. We were really excited about it. Uh, I believe the leads were there uh, as well. Um, that would be, uh, um, you know, Mr. Lee from uh, out in, uh, oh, gosh, California. I want to say the... Uh, Richard uh, Lee's um, uh, parents, uh, Ann Lee. Richard Lee. Yes. Ann Lee. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So they were there as well, and it was... I didn't get an opportunity to go. Unfortunately, I had, I had to work, but uh, I got the reports back, and I read them, too, and I and I talked to some folks that were there, and it was really positive news. Yeah, and... But, uh, uh, but this is... One of, one of the reports I got from one of though, we, we haven't had anybody speak in opposition to any bill that we brought into the, to the committee yet. Um, into any committee, we've had a couple of bills that have gone through. It's, uh, I, you know, this is a good sign of the times, though. It really is that things are beginning to change, even here in the Lone Star State in Texas. Yeah, and, and how, does, how is this being reflected in the legislature, though? I mean, uh, you know, we get a situation. I just came back from Idaho where 75% of the people support medical marijuana, but the state goes and votes on a resolution saying, hell no, we'll never legalize medical. Uh, is there a same disconnect in Texas between the people and the elected officials? There is a big disconnect. I, I don't believe that it's the same. I've been reading the news in Idaho, too, I, and I refuse to believe it's the same because these legislatures, these guys that are down there, these folks that are representing us, they are our neighbors. I've talked to my legislature till I'm blue in the face. You know, he's slowly coming around, and he's slowly coming around because other people have talked to him, too. The more people that go to the legislatures, at least from what I've noticed here in Texas, there is a disconnect. Don't get me wrong. We still have um, a very similar polling numbers, uh, poll right between 70 and 75 percent for medical marijuana, between 40 and 50 percent for flat-out legalization. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's respected around the country. And, uh, but I do notice that the conservative legislature isn't representing the will of the people yet, but it's not as bad as it is there. What, are there any sort of uh, inside Texas politics things that are holding this up? I mean, when we, for example, we look at New Jersey, and obviously there's a lot of pharmaceutical companies in New Jersey, so that affects the politics of how medical marijuana is implemented there. Are there oil or banking or any any type of uh, big lobbies perhaps prisons and sheriffs that are that are holding this up in texas if they are they're doing it in such a surreptitious way that we're unaware of it mm. honestly i believe it's just a matter of education texas has been slow to come around to the medical marijuana side of the argument you know i moved here in 2008 after retiring from the military I'm sorry, in 2007, after retiring from the military, when I got here, I noticed, you know, there were some things that were changing. Obama became president, and then we had this explosion of dispensaries around the country. Texas is just now kind of coming around to some of this way of thinking. We've had a very conservative legislature in place uh, for a very long time. So as our numbers grow in activists and reformers want to see change, the, the more success that we have around the country, we just capitalized that on uh, – in, in, in forms of business plans, and we just try to educate. What I, I think what our biggest fault is, really, as reformers, to be critical about ourselves, is that we haven't done a great job of educating our legislature before this session. I think that a lot of us waited, and I even, even me included, kind of waited until the legislature started to meet before we started to introduce our bills and talk to them. We really should have introduced these, these new bills and some of these other ones that we have, too, two years ago and really politics really hard with everybody in the legislature, really hard for two years, we would have been more successful. How much time is left for your session? We meet every two years, and that's one of the dilemmas here in Texas, Mm -hmm. is the legislatures meet every two years, and uh, and they can vote and and rise up those issues through to the, you know, from the House to the Senate to the the governor, but they only meet every two years, so that's a, it's a problem. Yeah. So uh, are, are they concluding this session soon? 
Yes, they are. I don't have the dates in front of me. I can't tell you. When okay, but it's, it's relatively uh, soon, and then you've got another two years before we get another shot at this. So in between sessions, is there a coordinated effort to, you know, lobby these legislators one at a time at their home office? You know, there, there have been smaller efforts over the last two years to do this. I think that this time there's going to be a larger grassroots, a much larger organized effort between all of us reformers. This legislative session, what was really neat about this legislative session is we all, all of us reformers kind of came together, and there's more of us than there have been before, for the first time and really rallied around some of these bills. And I haven't seen that happen since before I moved here when we had our last really big uh, success in the Texas legislature because it was in I believe it was in 06, we passed a law here in the state of Texas so that we could cite people for marijuana possession instead of arresting them. And th- that became law before I got here. And so since then, there hasn't been a lot of movement in the legislature until now. This is really this, this bill that, that we've seen testimony in this committee and another one before this one we've had some pretty good success with. So we're just going to capitalize on this moving forward and and see what uh, what we can do over the next two years. Now that we've rallied together and championed over this, over this, let's say, guide on over these bills, then we can uh, capitalize on that success and take these same people and build a larger project plan to, to talk to our legislatures a lot more over the next two years. Um, at least that's my plan, and I'm going to work really hard, you know, here in the state of Texas to try to communicate and bring these groups together. Excellent. We're speaking with Larry Talley, who's with uh, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. You can learn more at leap.cc. And if you want to have a speaker like Larry or someone in your area to come out and speak to your local group, uh, that's what Leap's all about, bringing, you know, credibility to uh, ending the prohibition of drugs. And, uh, you know, we don't get much better credibility than a U.S. Navy intelligence specialist. And I wanted to kind of pivot to that for a second, talk a little bit about, you know, the international uh situation with respect to this war on drugs and most specifically how without affect texas would be mexico and you guys share the largest border with mexico there and we report on the stories day after day of the bloodshed and torture and horror that's going on there from the uh, mexican cartels is that becoming a talking point amongst reformers is that something you use in discussing the legalization issue and does it does it resonate you know, it, it, it is something that I thought I do talk about. Uh, we have to talk about the 60,000 plus people that have been killed in the drug war just south of the border, how we created the situation and how we are, how we as a, as a country using these policies that we had in place continue to perpetuate that. It's a very big talking point. It's hard for people here, though, as they're, as they're sitting in these rotary clubs or, or watching, watching from their computer and they listen to my speeches and they listen to his talk. It's hard for them to visualize 60,000 people. Yeah. That it's hard for them to, to imagine the carnage and the war that's taking place just you know, miles down south of us. Um, and, and so, so that's, I think, what the presentation does a pretty good job of is showing some pictures and demonstrating, uh, you know, from my paradigm and my experience. I worked in Central and South America in, uh, in the drug war and, and did a lot of stuff in, uh, in, in, to, to help support U.S. policies in bringing the U.S. to a drug-free America by 1995, which, mm. which of course, was a failed mission. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, it didn't work out so well, and that's what brought me into uh, over, over a lot of years into LEAP and where I am today. But you're, you're right. The carnage in, South in, in, in uh, Mexico is, is really beyond belief. And those people that have uh, worked with drug policy and have gone down there have have visually seen this and, and know that what uh, how how bad our policies really are. Yeah, you know, you made a you made a quick statement there about you know people can't imagine the sixty thousand dead. And when I when I think about imagination and education and how people see the world, I point my finger at the media. And I'm wondering about the Texas media there, the, the local stations, do they report on this Mexican drug war? And and if they do, I mean, I noticed when the bombings happened in Boston, the media wasn't sh- so shy about seeing, you know, blood and carnage in the streets and bones sticking out of legs that used to be there. But we never got those shots from Iraq, Afghanistan or this Mexican drug war. Do you think if we had a little more more coverage like we had for Boston with respect to the Mexican drug war, it wouldn't be so hard for people to imagine? I think we need to put a different face on that drug war. First of all, we send drug enforcement agents, not U.S. Army groups down in Mexico, to battle uh, drug warriors and cartel members. Oh, look, these people are insurgents. You call them what they are, 
and their insurgents. Instead of sending drug enforcement agency down to Mexico to fight this war, if the government of Mexico wants our assistance, we should be putting military troops down there to battle these insurgents so that we can ensure the stabilization of the country of Mexico. At the same time, coupled with programs here to legalize marijuana to cut off the the head off of that cart of all of those cartels, which is the main source of their income, is bringing marijuana across the border in the United States. So there's a lot of things that we could do as a country. There's a lot of policies that we need to change in order to affect this war on drugs. Do you think after he- all the war on drugs is just a war? It's just another word for a war on people. Because I'm going to tell you, I've been out there. I've I've carried a gun. I pointed it and I pulled a trigger. I'm going to tell you that drugs do not shoot back. They just <laughs> yeah. don't. People shoot back. This is a war on people. It's a war on people in South Central America. It's a war on people in South America. And it's a war on people here in the United States. And our government does not need to be in a war with people here in the United States. I'm wondering, uh, with respect to what you said about insurgency, if we were to apply an end to prohibition in America, you know, say we say we could wave the wand and get what leap prohib you know uh, promotes, which is you know marijuana legalization and b- sensible regulation of other drugs. If we could, if we could take that away, take that incentive and that that financing away from this insurgency. Would we have to deal with it like an actual insurgency and send military troops and have us in a Iraq or Afghanistan style warfare, you know, escalating south of our border? Well, hopefully that if we were able to come up with sensible policies that eliminated the, the profit, took away the profit from the cartels so that it would deflate the cartels, that the, that the cartels would then deflate themselves. Mexico would be able to deal with those armed gangs of people that are doing those bad things, trafficking people and committing murders. Those are the things that they want to go after. And, of course, they're going to deflate when there's no money. Yeah. You know, these cartels walk into towns, they buy the town, they buy the people. If they don't have money to do that, then we can certainly certainly expect that the cartel's power is going to be greatly diminished. There's, there's still going to be some leftover after we do this. There's going to be a transition period here in the United States and overseas, but it's easily overcome. We've done these types of things before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I say, the difference between a, a cartel and a gang is cash flow, and uh, we cut off some of that. Cut off some of that cash flow. We can treat them like the gangs they are, and it's going to be a lot easier situation. Um, Larry Talley with Leap Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. You can find him at leap.cc or copsaylegalizeddrugs.com. Uh, do you have any public speaking appearances where people can catch you coming up pretty soon? Absolutely. You know, this Saturday here in the downtown Dallas, I don't know if you folks know that are listening, but Russ Bilbill came out to Dallas last year and he participated in our annual marijuana march. Well, we have another annual marijuana march, and it's coming up this Saturday. This Saturday, though, we're going to be in downtown Fort Worth. DFW Normal stands for Dallas Fort Worth Normal. So this year, in, in respect to our to, to the old Fort Worth, we're going to be out there at uh, at the Federal Plaza at noon, and we would love to have anybody that's listening to us come out and just join us. It's going to be a wonderful time. There's going to be music. There's going to be protests. There's going to be speakers. I'm going to be speaking. We have a lot of speakers. It's going to be a lot of fun. So All right. that was that's my next speaking opportunity. It's going to be Saturday at 3.30 in downtown Fort Worth. All right. Well, hope you guys have fun. May the 4th be with you. And uh, have fun in Fort Worth on the 4th. It's like a tongue twister. Larry Talley from Leap, thanks for joining us. And we'll talk to you again sometime. Thank you, Buzz. All right. When we come back, time for a little personal radical rant be right back we'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the russ Belville show you're tuned into the russ Belville show the voice of the marijuana nation. Cast your eyes up to the skies. What is it to live and die? Normal stands for responsible adult cannabis use. If cannabis use is causing problems in your life, consider taking a break or seeking medical assistance. Consider ceasing cannabis use if you have a family history of mental illness. Don't drive or operate heavy machinery while impaired by cannabis use. Cannabis use is not without risks, even though the risks are far less than those posed by legal drugs. Five of the last-
last seven major party candidates to run for president, three of the last seven vice presidential candidates, and the last three presidents have all smoked pot. Marijuana, the gateway drug to the White House. This is the Russ Belleville Show. You want answers? I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! And you have offended a Shaolin Temple. You can't handle the truth! Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! Radical Rant. The price of activism, or be careful what you wish for. Um, today I'm just going to take a personal time for this last part of the show, and uh, that's the way it's going to be, so you can fast forward, or if you're listening on podcasts, stop it if you want, because this has nothing to do with marijuana legalization or the or the fight, it's just kind of my life, and I, I got to talk about it because I, well, I need someone to talk to, and you're here, so I'm going to talk to you. Um, April 30th, as you know, uh, I was down in, uh, was coming back actually from Boise, Idaho on the 29th. I'd been down there for the, uh, Idaho three press conference, Lindsay Reinhardt and all that. And the 30th of course was Willie Nelson's birthday. It was his 80th birthday. And we gave a shout out to that, but it was also my oldest niece's 19th birthday on, on, uh, that Tuesday. And I completely forgot and, um, kind of bummed me out that I forgot, uh, it was brought up to me. <laughs> um, if you don't know, um, I'm getting divorced and my ex-wife wife to not be soon, I guess, whatever the term is, uh, still lives here. So, <laughs> so we talk, you know, we still interface and, uh, she reminded me, did you remember Samantha's birthday? And I didn't, I'd completely forgotten. Cause I was kind of, you know, kind of, uh, <laughs> busy. I guess I was kind of overwhelmed. I was thinking about my friends who I, you know, recruited into the marijuana movement and, you know, supported and pushed and promoted into getting a medical marijuana initiative and counseled and advised, got their kids taken away and were facing possible felony time in prison. And so I was a little distracted, I guess. And, uh, that was bad enough, but then I got an email from said niece who was upset because everybody else in the family, everybody else in the close family, including soon to be ex-wife, uh, remembered her birthday and, um, I did not. And then that was followed up by another email about, but I see you posted a lot about pot that day. Maybe you should think about your priorities. And, um, yeah, so that, that's, that's, that was my day yesterday. On top of that, another email I got from, I think it was Facebook, some activist, uh, who I've gone rounds with before who said I would be more effective an activist if I would, uh, concentrate more on communicating with the oppressor than on partying with the oppressed. Yeah, that's what I was doing. I was partying with the oppressed when I drove across the state to go do a press conference and all that. So it's been kind of a rough, uh, year and I just needed to sit and talk about it a little, um, be careful what you wish for. Cause you might get it. Um, <laughs> this has, uh, been probably the toughest year of my life in losing my dream job and my car and my wife and my home and my, uh, dog who's barking now and the Packers bar, AKA church all closed down. But I keep doing this and, and sometimes I have to think why, <laughs> you know, why do I keep doing this? And it's because, you know, of, of all of you out there that I've met and all the people whose lives have been so much more devastated than mine, who've had their kids have guns pulled at their heads, who've lost their loved ones, who've gone to prison over this. And I think of all of the, uh, help and, and 
support that I get from this community. And it just, it's so tough sometimes because the, the, the legal prohibition on marijuana also creates a cultural prohibition. You know, I like, for example, you know, my, my mom and dad will come out and see me when I'm in Boise, you know, see, they'll see me do the speeches and all, but just them, you know, nobody else in my, my whole extended family lives in Boise uh, in the area, but just them, of course. And they say they're proud of me. They were proud of what you do, but I, I just can't imagine that say, you know, when I get an article, you know, a feature article in high times that mom is photocopying it and passing it out to her friends in church to show how proud she is. I doubt that's happening. And, you know, uh, the family I have, you know, it's not that I dislike them or anything, but I can understand how difficult it's got to be living in Idaho and it's conservative and they're not involved with marijuana. And what do you say at the, at the, picnic or the gathering when they ask what your oldest son's doing i imagine they get a lot of he's a writer (laughs) or something you know something nice and vague i'm sure probably not a one of the nation's leading proponents for the legalization of marijuana i doubt that's what comes out so uh you know i just i i keep i keep doing this because it uh I don't know what else to do. I know that, you know, that I'm really good at uh, analyzing things and researching facts. And I have a way of being able to take lots of disparate information and complex ideas and boil them down to nice, simple sound bites and to motivate an audience and to do public speaking and to provide research and you know, I suppose that could be directed in lots of ways to lots of ends, but every time I meet people in the cannabis community, every new family or listener or person I meet, uh, from state to state are the most wonderful, kind, generous, giving people and the least deserving of this criminal prohibition and cultural rejection. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I, in my mind, I see what we're doing here as a civil rights battle. And I see you and me as people, we are a people. We are, when I say the cannabis community or the marijuana nation, that's really what I feel. That's, I, I feel that's who I belong to. I feel that's my tribe. I feel that's my people, you know, other people get to be, I don't know, uh, Christians or black or gay or whatever group they identify with. And we've got all them too. (laughs) I mean, I'm, I'm kind of rambling, but what I'm trying to say here is it's so important to me. It's so, it's so obvious and so crystal how important it is to fight this injustice. And, and I can see so clearly what an injustice it is. And I can see so deeply how it affects so much in this country that it astounds me that other people can't see it. And so I'm compelled to continue to try to explain it, (laughs) I guess, uh, to as many people as I can on my limited budget and limited reach, but I just keep doing it. And I think, you know, I, I, I imagine, you know, what if I was doing, taking the same tack here? What if I was doing this same exact, you know, have an internet show, travel the country, lecture, whatever, but I was doing it on, I don't know, global warming. Or if I was doing it on, you know, uh, Amnesty International, you know, ending torture and human rights abuses. Or if I was even, you know, even involved with say PETA or vegetarianism or something, how much different it might be, how I might get all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to say accolades, but respect and admiration from my family and from my, you know, old friends back in Idaho. If it were something that they could proudly be able to tell their friends, you know, wow, did you see Russ was on the news in Atlanta? 
you know, work. And, and uh, okay, if it was something like Peter or vegetarianism and they were in Idaho, it still might be a little cultural taboo, but they could at least talk about it. They could at least be proud of it, I guess. You know? Did you see Russ debated a, a guy from the government? So, I guess the point of this rant is to say, be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. And I, I just, this is what I wished for was to to have a platform to be an activist to fight this fight and uh i got it so um i guess it's a warning to others <laughs> if you're going to get involved with this <laughs> be careful what you wish for, what you wish for but you know i guess i guess maybe that's why you guys support me so much is because maybe maybe you're a lot in the same situation i am Maybe this is, you know, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Maybe you've also, you know, been kicked out of school or lost a job. Or maybe you're that person in the neighborhood that everyone knows is the pothead. And uh, maybe you feel the same way I do on some of these things. Maybe that's, uh, maybe that's what keeps this community together. You know, when I, when I was in high school, I... <laughs> If you want to know why I got the name Radical Russ, <laughs> a little short story here. It has nothing to do with, you know, being exceptionally radical. I'm not really radical in that sense of the word. It has to do with the fact that when I was in high school, we had a group that was called the NHS Radicals. That's Nampa High School. But we had this little fraternity, this little club called the Radicals. And we actually, we were kind of a trench coat mafia. We used to wear trench coats to school back before it was, you know, goth and cool, I guess. But, um, yeah, we had this little group called the radicals. We were this little kind of pep squad fraternity thing. And I was kind of a leader of it, although it was kind of leaderless, but I was the organizer, I guess. And, um, one thing about that group that I always remembered is that we were kind of the group of the people who had been rejected from all the other groups. You know how the cliques are in high school, right? It's so like I was kind of the honor student, but didn't really fit with the honor students, you know, and Rick, he was kind of the jock, but he didn't really fit with the jocks. And Mike was kind of the, the, the boozer, but didn't fit with the boozers and, and so on. We had this group of guys, you know, uh, and we were always kind of the, the, the group of the rejects that all banded together. And sometimes that's what, uh, sometimes that's what this feels like when we're doing cannabis community stuff is that. You know, if marijuana was legal, I don't know that if, if a whole lot of us would ever hang out together. <laughs> you know what I mean? Think of how disparate we are. Think how different we are from the from the Vietnam vet to the stoner skateboarder, from the the marijuana lawyer to uh, to me. I mean, <laughs> we're a we're a hell of a hell of a diverse group, and so we're kind of the group of all the people who had to band together because I love because of this uh, thanks Cass appreciate that <laughs> because of this um, because of this prohibition you know the culture of outlaws anyway uh, thanks for listening to me r ramble just a little bit because um, the way my brain works I can't really concentrate on the job I have to do when there's this stuff going on and I don't have uh, a lot of outlets anymore to to be able to talk about these things so thank you for listening sorry for indulging myself here i'll be better tomorrow and we'll have a great rant for you we'll continue fighting this prohibition so until next time take care of each other tokers is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com.
you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you 